and welcome to The Other Marthas, the show where a drama student and a film graduate try to make sense of things we wish we were qualified in instead, with an emphasis on history, mystery and all things morbid. A quick disclaimer before we get started, we don't claim to be experts in any of the topics we'll be discussing, so while everything we say will be based on individual research, it's all a bit of fun and we suggest that you take everything we say with a pinch of salt. I'm Martha, I'm the drama student. And I'm the other Martha, the film graduate. So Martha, what are we talking about today? Well, Martha, today I had a little root around and I thought we might chat about the life of Mary Shelley. So Mary Shelley is born Mary Godwin on the 30th of August, 1797. She's the daughter of William Godwin and Mary Wollstonecraft, both of whom are radical writers. William Godwin is an atheist and he's written books, including An Inquiry Concerning Political Justice, which attacks all political institutions and things like marriage and religion as well, which is fun. And also Things As They Are or The Adventures of Caleb Williams, which apparently attacks the aristocracy in novel form. So that's fun. And Mary Wollstonecraft very, very famously wrote a vindication on the rights of women. And she was a very, very head of her time radical feminist. So Mary Shelley was always going to be... We stand them both. Exactly. Mary Shelley was always going to be pretty cool. And possibly quite weird. And she was, I think it's safe to say. So Mary Wollstonecraft, Mary's mother, died when Mary was only a few days old. But William Godwin shared her views that girls should have the same education as boys. And so Mary Godwin was always given access to a really good education. Fun little fact, um, some of the cultured people who would visit and uh, Godwin would be like, hey Mary, I've got someone for you to chat to at the dinner table. And those people would include uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, um, the famous poet, Charles Lamb, the also famous poet, and Aaron Burr, who fled to London after killing Alexander Hamilton in his duel. So that's fun. That's if anyone wondered what happens after that whole debacle. He comes and visits Mary Godwin in her little family home and and gives her an education. So that's fun. This is at the point in which Percy... Oh, actually, no. I hate Shelley. Yeah, well, that's all right. This is... I was going to boo to be like, oh, we hate Godwin. But actually, Shelley is the true serpent in all of this. Percy. To be honest, I think they could all be described as victims in quite a heavy sense. But yes, Percy is sort of where things go a bit awry. Well, I know I know a little bit about this. I'll come clean. This isn't one of those episodes of the podcast where it's like, oh, I've never heard of this before. Yeah. Like, I know about Mary Shelley's life because despite the fact that I was rubbish at English lit, I know some things. And so, yeah. you know, I know what's coming. Yeah. And I just want to be honest with everyone <laughs> that I'm not unaware of what she gets up to in her life. Yeah, but I think I think there will be some things that are surprising because the English lit interpretation didn't deem some of them particularly relevant. But some of them, I think, are hilarious. Unlike some people, I didn't just read the little document that our teacher gave us and was like, here's the life of Mary Shelley. (laughs) I was like, okay, let me get my little self on Wikipedia. Although we did that with Emily Dickinson as well. We only read the little document and then we found all sorts about Mary Dickinson later. Um, yeah, Emily Dickinson actually could make a great episode because she was, we were led to believe certain things about her that a quick Google would really very much dispel. Um, we should have we done should, our I own I bet research. there were some people in our class. Yeah, but I bet there were some people in our class who were like, Googled it and knew. And we were all writing our essays like, Emily Dickinson led a solitary life, baking cakes for children and laying them out the window. And she was probably there like, I know the truth about Emily Dickinson, but I'm not going to tell anyone so that I can pass the exam better than them. I bet the snakes. Maybe, anyway, maybe. I'm very angry tonight. Yeah, you are a bit. I've said about sorry. one sentence about Mary Shelley. <laughs> um. Sorry, sorry, I'll be quiet now right this is where percy buys shelley or beesh or whatever you want to say it's a stupid name frankly and i'm just going to call him percy shelley beesh? you know percy beesh beesh what do you say i dislike him even more but you know his middle name well, i don't how know do how it's spelled b-y-s-h-e or something oh. i think people say bish but that just sounds stupid to me b-y-s-h-e something like that <laughs> <S-H-E-H-E-H-E>. or- <laughs> i feel like that is definitely oh I'd probably say Baish. Yeah, that, okay, good. That's what I'd say. I, I'd probably say Baish, like reading it. If I was just to read it. Percy Baish Shelley, yeah. Whatever, Percy Shelley. 
comes into the tale at this point. He used to come and visit William Godwin a lot. So Percy Shelley was a young, up-and-coming poet, and he very much admired William Godwin because uh, William Godwin, as previously discussed, was a radical writer. But his affections quickly diverted themselves when young Mary, at the time Godwin, returned home from staying with friends in Scotland. She had been staying there because her health was fragile and, I don't know, Scotland is good. So she she's deemed well enough to return home in 1814 when she is 16. And Percy is immediately struck by um, not just her beauty, she was a very striking lady, but also her intense curiosity and academia and charm. People are very complimentary about her at this time. In fact, um, Martha, I'll, I'll, I'll make this a participatory event. Can you guess who said this about Mary Shelley? She had light auburn hair of burnished brightness like the autumnal foliage when played upon by the rays of the setting sun. Who do you think might have written that about Mary? Um, what's the name of that man who is not Shelley but is also horrible? Are you talking about Lord Byron? Uh, Byron. I was going to be like, oh, he's kind of the player of he, the he age. He was a player. That's a, Actually, that's a really good guess, but no, it's not. It was Mary's Herself. sister. Oh, that's nice. This is very nice. It's a little, a little intense. But people were like, that's they had nothing true. else to do other than describe <laughs> their sister in weird detail. <laughs> no, wait, I, I was going to say, I quite like that in this period of history, people are a lot more just openly, um, I don't know, uh, nice and close with people that they're not in a romantic relationship with. Like they express their admiration and such. Uh, and it's it's not an object of shame. And I like that. Martha's yeah, I... doing an expression that I believe I can interpret as, no, but they, they were in love with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're so good at reading my expressions. Yeah. No, I'm not saying all the time people are in love with each other. But obviously, if, and I'm not, I am not <laughs> saying that these step-siblings were in a relationship, no, because no. that is a whole thing that we don't Although, need to look into. We'll, get, we, well, we, we may. We may, but my point is that obviously if you can't be like, hey, I love a lady or I love mm. a man, you know, depending on which is scandalous at the time for you, yeah. then <laughs> you will be like, my friend who I love and we're bedfellows, she's so pretty and I love her so much. And obviously like we kiss each other, but we're just <laughs> friends. Yeah, that's true. A lot of it is probably... Just lack of understanding that actually you are horny for your bestie and that's fine, but you don't. But have a no, there is. I'm sure that there's. I'm sure there's some platonic love going on there, and I think that's cute. Can Absolutely. I also say I've looked up a picture of Percy, and he is quite pretty, isn't he? He's a very uh, rakish fellow. <laughs> what does rakish mean? He looks like a well, rake. Thinking about it, actually, yeah, I guess so. Well, he's a yeah, he's he's a very good looking young man. Um, I mean, he's, he's quite he's sort of pretty, willowy. Though. Yeah, yeah, he is. That's he how I define him. He's rather quite than like slight and kind of delicate looking, I guess. Rather than like rugged or you know. Yeah, rather than you know Richard Armitage, he'd be portrayed by Eddie Redmayne. Mm. I think Eddie Redmayne <laughs> would do a good job. I, um, well, they always get him to play the pretty people, don't yeah, they? Yeah, I but know. It's quite frustrating. Well, who would you I who, think, who would you bestow on? I don't know many actors. I know. No. <laughs> it's always like the constant foolery of my life is that yeah. I, I have studied film and work in TV <laughs> and I don't know any actors. So then I'm always like, oh, that's the actor because everyone's doting on them. But I yeah. get home and I'm like, oh, I just did this with this actor. And my mum's like what i know that person and admire them and i'm like i didn't know who they Should were but okay well it's probably to be fair <laughs> it's better yeah i was gonna say because you're not fawning over people or i'm not awkward because i'm just like oh hello person <laughs> yeah i hear you're the actor <laughs> it's, it's me the too. wardrobe assistant i'm never like hello who are you i'm yeah. gonna do that yeah. oh have you ever been in anything i'd have seen and they're like oh, so yeah. if you had to list yourself you know a b c just don't even bother where would you put yourself have you ever been in time's best looking women <laughs> yeah no i don't do any of that it's just sometimes i go in and i'm like yeah don't don't know any of these or like i'm like oh i've seen you on something but i don't yeah. know i don't know who you are if that means anything anyway yeah, yeah. <laughs> So Percy, whom we've established, is attractive and may or may not 
be playable by Eddie Redmayne at some stage. He is really into Mary. Her half-sister may also be a bit into her, but that's fine. Shelley at this point is 22, and he is already married to uh, Harriet, previously Westbrook, now Shelley. But within a few weeks of knowing Mary, he and Mary start stepping out. The only time that they can kind of be themselves and chat about their feelings and stuff is when they're on walks around the local graveyard, where... Mary likes to visit very often for a spot of alone time uh, and a book because that's where her mum's grave is and she feels very close to her, which is lovely. Just lovely. You know, that that unique bond between mother and daughter. So on their walks, uh, they have to be chaperoned so that it's proper. So who should go with them? But Claire Claremont, she's the half sister who wrote the fun stuff about the auburn hair. Um, and she comes along with them. And at one point, they're on a walk. They leave Claire Claremont sitting on a grave, is what I've written down. I don't know if she sat there voluntarily or they were like, hold on, Claire, just don't... Poof. He won't mind. They go to Mary Wollstonecraft's grave, where Mary makes a declaration of love. She says to uh, Percy Shelley, I am yours, body and soul. And then they shag on her mum's grave, which I'm just going to leave there for a second, just to... Yeah, we all got... Yeah, good. Good, good, good. I know Martha was aware of that, but you may not have been. You might have needed a minute. So I hope that was enough. Yes, so they consummate their relationship in very weird circumstances. And they pretty much then go home. They say to um, William Godwin, Mary's dad, we're going to elope. He says, no, you're not. They say, but I, we thought that you were anti-religion and marriage establishment. And he was like, yes, but the thing is, I do still own a business. And I have been married twice. And actually, I don't really live by the, the things that I write. They elope anyway. Plus Claire Claremont, you're just hanging out. Yes. So Mary's like 16 at this point? She's 16. Right. So is Claire a half-sister? Yeah. Not a stepsister? Yeah. So you're... Oh, I thought they were stepsisters. She does have a stepsister called so... Fanny Imlay, who's older. Okay. Just the I'm name. Quite proud of myself. How just does, that. Um, <laughs> oh, good point. How old is Claire at this point? Like seven or what? No, 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 no. Um, I think she's she's more or less of an age with Mary, but I think slightly but younger. How if they're half sisters? What do you mean? Mary Shelley's mum dies in childbirth with Mary Shelley. Ish, we yeah. assume Mary Shelley's dad then mm-hmm. has somehow impregnated, married, yeah, and impregnated a woman. Yeah. With the speed that they're the same age. Well, no, I'm saying they're like more or less of an age, by which I mean there's probably like one or two years between them. And that's me having a Oh, so they've kidnapped a 14 year old. Something along those lines. Yeah. I feel like I would be Claire. Like, like, can I come? Say if it was like you're Mary Shelley. Yeah. Like, Mm. I feel like you would. You would be like, oh, I'm eloping with my boyfriend. And I'd be like, oh, I'll come. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and you'd be like, oh, no, thank you. Yeah, it'd be one of those things where it'd be like, so Percy and I are just going to go and have a rest upstairs. And Claire's like, oh, I want to have a rest. We can have a slumber party. And they're like, okay, yay, Claire. Ooh. At this point, when Percy and Mary elope, Both Mary's dad and Percy's dad pretty much cut them off, disown them. So Percy's dad is a guy called Sir Timothy Shelley. He's very wealthy and ordinary Percy would be receiving quite a hefty allowance. But his son has now, you know, run off with a 16 year old despite being married with two kids, by the way. (gasps) I know. This is like a few weeks in. Like you just, you know, get over it. But anyway, I'm going I'm really going off of Percy. Yeah, he, he he's he's not great. But yeah, so they're, they're now cut off. They elope, they uh, have a lovely tour around Europe and then they, the three of them, come back to London, kind of tails between their legs because they've spent all their money. And they're like, can we have a loan? And everyone's like, no. So then they set up in London and tried to... I have an elaboration mm. on their interrailing around London. I mean, yeah, around Europe. Around Europe, yeah. Stop me if this comes later. But they walked the whole way round when they ran out of their money they just started walking and they were like walking through the Alps and France and they were like oh my feet really hurt and Shelley's like we've got to keep walking (laughs) I didn't know that that's 
God, they're morons, aren't they? Yeah, so they were like, <laughs> they walked around Europe, which is a thing nowadays, but like... But they didn't mean <laughs> to. Joking. Mary and Claire will have been wearing like the big gowns. Yeah. And the like heavy gowns and like high heels and they were hiking. Brilliant. So there we are, that's an image. I love all. that. Actually though, I'm glad you did that interlude anyway, because I forgot to say, not only is it three people on this elopement, but um, Claire Claremont's mum follows them to try and get Claire back and then at some point I guess just turns back because Claire's not coming but I love that it's like we're eloping oh great with with our sister ah oh, followed by the mum this is a little train of people that's so silly I know <laughs> when they get back Mary falls pregnant quite quickly um, and she's in bed a lot and at this point Claire and Percy start spending a lot of time together and kind of going out together a bit and Mary's not best pleased but Percy um, is like oh don't you worry Mary see when I'm out of wooing with Claire I'm gonna send in my mate Thomas Jefferson Hogg and he is gonna woo you and Mary's like I would prefer to actually just have you my husband around would be quite a like and he's like no 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 no. I'll be with Claire but my friend did Percy, for, did Percy kill off his last wife then uh no we'll come to her no, he's he's oh, okay. still married. So, to, did they um, marry then? He and Mary, no, they don't work, marry until later. Um, but oh, okay. I will come to it. Don't worry. But yeah, at the moment, it, she's just his mistress. They're shacked up together with also Claire. She's pregnant. He and Claire are stepping out a bit, and so he sent in his mate. So Percy basically, and it's was, not Thomas Jefferson, is it? No, but he is called Thomas okay. Jefferson Hogg, like someone dressed up a pig in a wig and like it's Thomas Jefferson Hogg. <laughs> Anyway, so Percy was kind of into, I don't know, swinging, polyamory kind of thing. He invited his wife Harriet to join them in Switzerland on the giant train of elopement. She didn't come. She quite sensibly stayed at home with her two young children. I do know this to be true of Percy. He was part of, you know how like in this time, men like to be like, oh, I'm part of this society and this is what oh, you believe. Yeah. He was part of that, one of this society where one of their things was like, oh yeah, we don't believe in monogamy. That was right. one of that. One yes, of yeah, no, no, you're right. It was one of those underground things. And it was him and like some other poets just being like, love is love, man. Yes. Right, so as a part of this, he sends in his mate. But the thing is, Mary, like, she's kind of on board with it, but she's not sure. She's like, I'm cool to kind of flirt with this guy, but I don't know if I sort of want to commit to it being a romantic thing. That's it's a bit weirdly with me. So they write a few love letters to each other, Mary and Hogg. But Mary kind of fannies about for so long that eventually, by the time she's like, yeah, no, I can commit, Hogg's like, actually... At this point, you're five months pregnant and I just, it's, it, this is a really weird situation and I'm going to go. So Hog gets out of there and Claire Claremont also finally moves away for a little bit. Um, so the couple kind of are back together and are like, okay, that was a bit of a weird blip. We'll move past it. Um, interestingly, they have a shared journal and they tore out the pages that correspond to the days in which Mary and Hog were writing love letters to each other. So make of that what you will they I guess decided that they just didn't want to think about it so I get the impression that they didn't want to think about it because it didn't go right as opposed to because it was potentially a weird thing to have happen it was just like well he rejected our advances I found out more about Shelley's free love yeah go on uh situation Shelley wrote a poem this Percy Shelley wrote a poem in 1821 called now bear with my pronunciation a pit a <laughs> a pip psychidian um not a clue. which is known as a pre-modern manifesto to free love which okay. he saw as an ideal currency one that can't be spent and compounds with interest okay so there we are i'll be real i did that none of that went in that just kind of bounced off my skull but i, I okay. dare say Basically, when i listen he wrote a poem with his free love manifesto Mm. saying that everyone loves love and you can't spend it all and inexhaustible resource and uh, I see. that's nice for men I'm sure but the problem with free love in the 1800s is that it doesn't really work out that well for the women involved yes that's true it's yeah the children thing is, it's, happen yeah 
there are and then people don't claim them and Shelley. people leave each other and yeah polyamory in the modern day can clearly really work but in this time it seems to have been more of a, an excuse for the men to sleep around but yes uh, very <laughs> sadly the child with whom mary was pregnant uh, at this point was born very prematurely she was born two months prematurely in february of 1815 and died when she was only 12 days old before they had a chance to name her. Mary was obviously really affected by this. She writes a journal entry in March 1815, which reads, Dreamt that my little baby came to life again and that it had only been cold. We rubbed it before the fire and it lived. She goes on to sort of say things like, it's all she can think about and the sorts of things you would imagine. So Mary's... Yeah, I mean, fair enough. Yeah, absolutely. Mary's kind of honeymoon period if you will with Percy doesn't get off to the nicest start yeah it does kind of spoil the romance like yeah losing your baby so early on in your relationship like oh we're in love and yeah and she was and at this point she's 17 as well so like it would go very rapidly from like giddy woohoo to just it's suddenly very real but now we come to the infamous June 1816 Lake Geneva trip where Mary uh comes up with the idea for Frankenstein I feel like this is quite well documented, but I'll, I'll lay it out anyway. So present, we have Percy, who's kind of fleeing his wife back home. Mary, who's following him. Lord Byron, who is fleeing allegations of incest. <laughs> oh my God, Byron. And uh, Claire, yeah, watch out, Mary Shelley. Sister, who is lusting after Byron. I think they had a, a brief affair, which <gasps> may or may not have left her <laughs> pregnant. <laughs> So Byron allegedly is, you know, all in it with his half sister. Yeah. Claire <laughs> allegedly yeah. is all in it with Mary. So it makes sense <laughs> oh my God. for them to get together because they're both half sister lovers, strange people. Good point. I should point yeah. out that there's no allegation anywhere that Claire was remotely interested in Mary in a romantic way. But it's just something that's quite funny to think about nah. in this whole mess of stuff. It's the truth. Yeah, and also my favourite member of the party, Byron's doctor, John Polidori. John <laughs> was just, he's hes literally just Byron's doctor. He's invited along because he has access to Laudanum and they want to get high. But also what Byron didn't know was that the whole time John Polidori is taking notes for a tell-all gossip book about Byron. Um, I don't <gasps> think he goes on, I know, John. I don't think he goes on to write it. But Wait he's a been minute. Offered. That definitely breaks the patient doctor confidentiality oh, absolutely. situation. Yeah, but so does going on a piss up in Geneva. <laughs> well, I know, but there, you know, there was a time in history where people were like, oh, my doctor, like, you know, come along and people yeah, did. Yeah, I guess. But, but the fact that the doctor is being like, oh, Byron actually had a wart on his back. <laughs> it's not to do with medical stuff. It's uh, He was approached by a publisher who offered him 500 quid and was like, so Byron is definitely sleeping with his half sister. I hear you spend a lot of time with him. Just like, give us the gas. So he basically is making notes on a gossip column about Byron. So these guys are all on what essentially is it's a bit like a student bender in like Camos nowadays, but they're in Byron's summer home in Geneva because they're classy. However, it was not the break that they have been hoping for, uh, mainly because Mount Tambora in Indonesia had erupted just massively the previous year. And so it continued to cause weird weather patterns for years and years and years. years. But this, the subsequent summer, uh, was particularly affected with almost perpetual rain, says Mary, and uh, thunderstorms. So they spend a lot of time inside. They're mainly drinking a lot. They're taking a lot of laudanum and they're reading creepy poems and ghost stories aloud to each other. Now, this does take its toll. Apparently, at one point, Percy runs shrieking from the room, having hallucinated that Mary's nipples have turned into demonic eyes, which I love. I also don't know if Mary had her nipples out at this point, or if he he was just like, ah, not only am I imagining your nipples, but I'm imagining that they're not nipples, but demonic eyes. Either way, quite weird. And so they decide to divert themselves with a new activity. Byron famously challenges everyone to write their own ghost story with varied results. So Byron and Shelley are a bit crap, which is always fun because these are the two very lauded um, ahead of their time poets. Neither of them finished their stories. I don't know about Claire Claremont. I don't know if she tried to write anything or not. If anyone does know about that, feel free to let us know in the comments down below. And Polidori ends up creating a vampire story imaginatively named The Vampire, but with a Y, so it's cool which later goes on to inspire Ooh. Bram Stoker's It's like when Dracula. books spell magic. 
magic with like a K and a Y. Yeah, when they spell magic weirdly and it's like, oh, right, you've got no idea about your magic system then. Yeah, exactly. But yes, this would go on to inspire Bram Stoker's Dracula um, and supposedly Polidori's eponymous villain who's called, well, not eponymous, but the, the vampire called Lord Ruffin is strikingly similar to Byron. So clearly this guy has a bit of a vendetta uh, and I'm living for it. Yes. Claire, before we get on to Mary, apparently during the summer of 1814... That uh, that's beforehand. One? Or is it 1818? This she is wrote, 1816. Okay, she wrote a story called The Idiot, which I can only imagine she wrote about Percy. Yeah, actually, to be fair, because the summer of 1840 I'll keep looking. was during the elopement, so she would have been just third-wheeling Percy and Mary at that point. <sighs> The story of the idiot is about her following Percy yeah. and Shelley to traipse through Europe. <laughs> Day 33 of climbing the Matterhorn to get to France. <laughs> Why did I do this? Yeah, exactly. As you were. Oh, sorry, I'll, sorry. I thought I'll I'll sorry, I was like I waiting for you anything. to give me information. But I, I mean, I can. It. Mary Shelley yeah, wrote Frankenstein. <laughs> yes, yes, she did. Okay, um, yeah, thank you. I'll lead on okay, from that. I will. No, no. <laughs> oh, no, I know things. I know. <laughs> Let you me just hijack your episode. <laughs> you did. <laughs> That'd be so funny if I'm like, no, no, Martha, allow me to carry on. Right, yeah. So this is when Mary famously has her waking dream of seeing basically the plot of Frankenstein play out. He describes seeing the pale student of unhallowed arts kneeling beside the thing he had put together. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out. And then I stopped quoting, but she's like, oh, and then it shudders and comes to life or something. Now, I take that with a pinch of salt, the whole I had a waking dream and it inspired Frankenstein thing, because that description first came up as a prefix to the 1830 edition. And also, I can think of a slightly more, well, someone else has thought of it, and I agree, more likely inspiration which she maybe didn't want people to know about because it's so blatant on their elopement travels the Shelleys came upon uh, Castle Frankenstein which was built in the 13th century but in the 17th century it was notoriously inhabited by a guy called Johann Conrad Dippel who was an alchemist obsessed with immortality and so he made Dippel's oil which he said would make you live for 100 years and cure any ailments and he also was rumored to experiment with reanimating corpses and this guy lived in Castle Frankenstein um so i would argue yeah that that's probably a more likely inspiration than her having this waking vision she probably you know i dare say she had a sort of thing if she's maybe that inspired it you know yeah. the castle frankenstein inspired it but then when they were like oh we were gonna write a scary story she was like yeah then those images and you know how like mind. the two connect yeah and also everyone's always like oh mary shelley went and watched a frog be electrocuted and that inspired frankenstein and i've <laughs> yes. always thought like how no yeah like yeah. a lot of people that day watched a frog being electrocuted that's true maybe they not all of them wrote frankenstein, frankenstein. <laughs> yeah <laughs> no that's, that's true that mary shelley will have been cognizant of and interested in the works of erasmus darwin i believe it was who was experimenting with the nervous systems of dead animals yeah she's she just had a real fun scope of interests now frankenstein wasn't published until 1817 by which point more multiple tragedies had struck the shelleys so firstly mary's half-sister not claire claremont but fanny imlay who's older than her and who uh, is her half-sister with her mum, commits suicide on October the 9th, 1816. The circumstances surrounding it are a bit shady because a lot of the correspondence around the incident has been destroyed or is missing. And so there are various theories around it, but basically she was living with William Godwin um, and it probably got a bit too much because she was then sort of the only subject of William Godwin's anger and such. She went to Bristol. Oh, was he an angry man? Apparently so. That's pretty much all I could get from it was he was an angry man. So I can't comment on it. Okay. But yeah, she goes to Bristol and she I mails... imagined he was cute because he owned a bookshop. Yeah, but then he also does disown his daughter and all that. Probably a complicated person. Yeah, she goes to Bristol. She mails letters to Mary and also to William Godwin. And then she goes to Wales, checks into a hotel and takes an overdose of laudanum. When Mary gets her letter, she's very alarmed. Um, I don't know what was in it, but presumably it was things like I've written to say goodbye, you know. And so she immediately... I'm going to Wales. Exactly, yeah. She immediately goes to try and track her down i think she goes to bristol first because that's where it was mailed from but by the time she arrives in wales sadly it's too late so they're still reading from that in october when in december december 15th percy receives a letter 
saying that Harriet Shelley, his first wife, has been found dead, floating in the serpentine, having also taken her own life. And she, at the time, was pregnant by another man. She, Harriet Shelley did not really have it easy. There's also rumours around that because the whole affair was very quickly hushed up. But again, she probably just committed suicide because things were very bad. Now, was there any chance Percy could have pushed her in? Um, I think that is speculated as like a, oh no, marry Mary now. But it's not what happened, basically, is the gist of it. Now, Harry at least behind her two children with Percy and Percy wants custody of them, which is like a little bit too little too late, Percy, but okay. Harriet's parents are not happy with this because they're like, well, Percy, firstly, you're an atheist. Secondly, you abandoned Harriet with your infant children. And thirdly, you're living with a woman who's not your wife. So he's like, oh, okay, well, you know, I can't do anything about the past, but here, let me christen my child. Mary and Percy now have a son called William. And so they christen him for show or baptise him even, I think. And they also get married. And they're like, ta-da, now we can be the parents of these kids. I think Mary was very keen to invite these two children into her life. She's clearly a very motherly person. But eventually the courts are like, neither Harriet's parents nor the Shelleys are appropriate caregivers, which is probably fair enough. So the children go to a clergyman instead. Now- what? I know, I, I pff, these poor kids. I don't know how old they were as well, because I feel like, well, actually, thinking about it, the end of 1816, Harriet dies, and it was 1814 that Percy and Mary met. And I think Harriet and Percy's sons were both very young at that point. Let's call them, we'll call them one and two for the sake of arguments. This is speculation. If they were, say, one and two, then by 1816... What's wrong with the grandparents? I mean, maybe they could be... I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, they would have been at least three and... Is that what I'm saying? Three and four? Yeah. Which I guess is is young enough to still enter like a different family unit. But yeah, the grandparents probably would have been more appropriate. I don't know. They go to a clergyman. In the meantime, more tragedies for the Shelleys. Their second daughter, Clara, has died of dysentery just after her first birthday. And then William, who survives until he is three, catches a malarial fever in Rome and also dies. Following William's death, Mary falls into a really deep depression, very understandably, um, which also drives a wedge between her and Percy. And this is the bit, more than anything else, where I'm like, Percy is just a prick. Like, he starts writing poems like, Mary, where have you gone? Why are you distant from me? You are so cold. It's like, because three of her children have died in infancy, Percy. Like, why why are you speculating about yeah. this? It's very obvious why. Fortunately, their fourth child... It's like, Percy, oh, I wonder why my wife is so sad. Exactly. It's like, why is she so mopey and so cold? Like, she doesn't want to sleep with me anymore. It's like, no, Percy, give her some space. Anyway, their fourth child, fortunately, who's called Percy Florence, does outlive his parents, which is great, but Mary remains very depressed. This may have been partly hereditary as well. Percy uh, was quite... Um, Percy, their son, mm. he's so boring. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that's, I, that's I was a like, blessing, oh, wow, though. like Mary Shelley's surviving child. And I looked him up <laughs> and he is so boring. Yeah, I but- know, but you would think like the child of Percy and Mary Shelley that grew up around Lord Byron and all these people. And he's just yeah, like, true. oh, I don't know. He's like, oh, I'm a bank manager. It's fine. Okay, yeah, but- snore. Yeah, but to be fair, like, were you Mary Shelley? I feel like that would be the ideal for you. You'd just be like, oh, thank God, my son is boring. That is the best I could possibly wish for him. Imagine, like, birthday cards, like, dear my darling son, what's he called? Percival. Just Percy, Percy Uh, Florence. Thank you so much for being such a boring child. (laughs) I know that you will outlive us all. Much love, your darling mother, Mary. (laughs) Please continue to have no discernible personality. Don't take risks. Stay exactly where you are. No growth is good growth. (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) the depression may have been partly a hereditary thing as well, in that Mary Wollstonecraft uh, had also attempted to take her own life when she was younger. Funnily enough, when Fanny Imlay's dad left her, which was prior to her union with William Godwin. Which kind of makes sense because obviously Fanny Imlay, very sadly, also took her own life. So what a strong genetic 
wink. Fortunately, Mary did not go down that road. Spoilers, but hooray. Now, Percy starts to become unfaithful. Uh, He's complaining about how cold Mary is towards him. And at one point, he just registers this child in Italy as being his child with Mary. And Mary's like, that's not, I didn't, I would know if I'd had that child and I didn't. And he's just like, oh, what? Oh, it must be some mistake. Um, So people speculate that that's his child with Claire Claremont. But I'm not entirely sure why people speculate that, because Claire Claremont didn't look after the child or anything. It was just a child in Italy that was then fostered out and died in 1820. I suppose, well, you say starts to become unfaithful, but when Mary was pregnant with their first child, he was dating Claire. Yeah, I know. I feel like, yeah, I do. I was confused by that as well. I don't know if they just mean like blatant affairs or if they mean because they all lived together, like people view that with Claire Claremont as like, well, you know, it was an understanding. They were trying something out, whereas this is just... Yeah, I suppose also... There is evidence of women having, I mean, there's a lot of evidence of women having children and not looking after them and sending them off to someone else. So yeah, yeah, that's true. It could be, could be. But yeah, no, my point is like, I'm not really sure why they've decided to attribute it to Claire Claremont because I can't think of it. It could be literally any woman. Exactly, exactly. In the world. Yeah. (laughs) But either way, it wasn't Mary's child. Percy's just being a dick. But yes, in 1821, Mary falls pregnant again. It's apparent that uh, she and Percy have kind of somewhat rekindled their romance, which is nice. But it's a very stressful year. And sadly, she loses the baby, which again, is just, Mary Shelley has such a horrible time. But Percy Shelley has the forethought to put Mary in an ice water bath while the miscarriage is happening, which slows the bleeding and ultimately saves her life. So that's good. But just that's as the one good thing he's done. The one good thing he's done. But as they're getting closer again, it's like, oh, you know, they can, I was going to say they can forgive each other. She can forgive him. She's literally done nothing wrong. And uh, things are going okay. They both start getting plagued with visions of death. And like Mary starts getting hysterical wow. every time, I know, every time Percy goes near boats, which is weird until it's not <gasps> weird. I oh, know, oh, because on July 18th, 1821, Shelley drowns at sea. <sighs> Woo! So Mary is now a widow. A lot of Percy's friends start to shun her and she's like, why, why are you shunning me? They're like, oh, Percy always went on about how you were really cold, like in the last times and that was mean of you <gasps> oh no which is just horrible because also and she has a lot of journal entries at this time when she's going like i understand that i'm prone to irritability and depression and stuff and sometimes i'm not very like connected to people but i'm a really warm person and i care so much and it really hurts people are calling me cold like if they were calling me rash or impetuous or whatever then that would be different but they're calling me cold and i'm not cold which is just really sad. Like, this is clearly a woman who's, whose life has been defined by caring a lot. And now she's being treated in that way. It's very horrible. But she moves in with a friend called Jane Williams. Uh, they bond over the fact that Jane Williams is lover. This isn't funny. <laughs> Jane Williams is... <laughs> Jane Williams is lover drowned <laughs> with Shelley. So, like, it makes... It... <laughs> it's not funny. It's a nice... <laughs> Oh, it's so a nice funny. story of two women being united in their grief but it's just like it's just this so, i don't know i'm so sorry for laughing but there's something really funny about that anyway they like I move in mary shelley minds yeah thank, thanks mary. unless she's gonna haunt you tonight oh god don't i'll actually be really scared oh i mean i'll let you guys know next week but right so she she and jane are tight because their husbands both died on the same boat and you know it's all dandy but in 1827 so uh what six years after yeah six years after their husband's death she finds out that jane had had dalliances with percy and is like writing Who to hasn't? her friends yeah true <laughs> she shouldn't, shouldn't be surprised but writing to her friends like lol lol, lol mary still has no clue but 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 I That's know. so sad. So Shelley, Mary Shelley remains friends with her, but she can never like properly trust her again, which is fair enough. So she, Ooh. she's she been living with Jane till like 1827. And then she finds out about the whole Dalliancy thing and is like, oh, no, thank you. So in 1828, she goes to visit a friend in Paris, gets smallpox and is disfigured for like the rest of her life. But weirdly enough, that tragedy, which is comparatively small, I suppose, kind of she just has quite a sense of humor about because she's used to being like this tragic beautiful young woman who's lost so much and now i only caught the gist of the story so i could be wrong about it 
but she has admirers who are like, hey, can we cast you as like the troll in this pantomime? And she thinks it's really funny. So she starts writing stuff about like oh, she's really insulting but she's just like lol never been cast as the ugly one before it's great so she's having is, a fantastic is, time is she masking her pain with humor though oh god i hope not because the thing is i think she's quite I, obviously people change but she's generally quite in tune with her own emotions so i like to think that she genuinely just found it quite funny okay yeah, but I don't know. Um, she also still did have admirers, including the American songwriter Howard Payne, but I don't think she pursued anything with them particularly. She did stay friends with Byron, though, which is nice. He supported her and she immortalised him in the later work, which I couldn't be asked to properly find out about. And she also keeps writing. She writes more things about reanimation. She writes about women with troubled relationships with their dads. Throughout her relationship with Percy, she was kind of keeping them afloat by writing um, little articles in the Daily Gazette and stuff. And she continues to write novels after his death as well. And in 1851, she dies of brain cancer and is buried with her parents who've been moved to Bournemouth. I assume she also at this point lives in Bournemouth and yeah. she's had her parents moved close to her. Her son is uh, by her side and all is comparatively sort of okay. Her surviving son, Percy Florence, mm. go, he's bid farewell to his mum and he, he decides to go through her um, her drawers, you know, to find the sentimental yep. artefacts she's kept. So he's going through, she's like, ah, oh, love letters between my father and my mother. Mm, how quaint. Ah, yes, uh, uh, I don't know, portrait of Mary Wollstonecraft in her heyday. And, oh, what a, a little silk parcel. What's this? Um, and he unwraps it and it's the calcified remains of Percy Shelley's heart. Make of that what you will. And that's Mary Shelley. Yeah, everybody. I knew of that. I think it's wonderful. Isn't it? I think more people should do that. What, keep the, their yeah, lovers calcified I think it's remains? Yeah, I mean, not obviously, you know, there's there's certain laws about keeping human remains in your desk drawer. But Hello. I think if you are going to be a gothic icon, to be fair, go the whole keep hog. your husband's heart in your drawer. Yeah, to be fair, I was when yeah, I was um, exactly. looking up sources for this, I found on Google one of the first results was called like Mary Shelley being goth in 2020 or something. So clearly she's still very current. I I think she's an incredible woman and clearly her life has been very much defined by things that have happened to her, which have been largely horrifying. But mm. she writes... I have a question. Um, ...the first sci-fi novel ever and just is, is all around Ooh. a bit of a badass really. So good on her. Yeah, what's your question? So with this shipwreck, was she then on the beach like, everyone quick, get away, I must have his heart. <laughs> um, and just like on the beach, he's like cutting his heart out. No, he's like, but my uh, desk. Because I think his body was taken to be cremated. And I think I'm right, right in right. saying that his father, who was still alive at this time, she asked for his heart or for, for like the ashes of his heart. And he said no. But then she ended up with oh. it. So I don't know if it was like he died and then she was like, guys, whoever's inherited the estate, can I just have my husband's heart? And they're probably like, be our guest. We really don't want it. I don't know. Or maybe he did but secretly I don't understand. give it to her. So or... did they cut the heart out? Because obviously once mm. it's cremated remains, there's no like, oh, this not is not like, the oh, that's the heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very good point. I don't know. Because it, I, the heart was supposedly charred. And I guess actually though, <laughs> wait, but cremation in the 19th century will will have been yeah. different because it would have been burning a body on a physical fire. And I well, yeah, it I wouldn't think, have been um, as easy for things to just turn to ash, I guess. So I don't know if it, if it would have been a case of like, oh, yeah. there's some remnants. Uh, one second. Because I know of this, but I'm just looking at the dates. Okay, so the first American cremation mm. was in 1876. And obviously that's like modern cremation, not just putting a body on a fire. Yeah, Because yeah. people have been doing that since Forever. people. Yeah. But in the first American cremation, they had kind of like a big house mm. with furnaces in mm. that would get very hot and ash yeah. up a body. Makes so yeah, sense. I suppose he could have just, they were just sort of like, oh, we've cooked him a bit. Let's chuck him in the cathedral. Because yeah. I thought he was buried in like Poet's Corner or something. Yeah, I don't know. So maybe they did just burn him a bit. But then that seems really redundant. <laughs> like if, you, if you're planning on... terrible cremation! <laughs> like if you're planning on... Um... <laughs> burying a body surely it makes more sense to just bury it as is 
But I don't know. Oh, maybe they changed their mind halfway through. What? And got a fire poker and got him out of the fire. And we're like, we've changed our mind. <laughs> oh, God. It's a bit charred around the edges. This Wait, is horrible. This is such a... Oh, God. Like, poke him out of the fire. Yeah, I know. Um, but yeah, the well, answer basically is that I don't know. He, he may not even he have been wasn't a great but that guy. was the information that I got very much indicated that he That's was. That's the legend. Yeah. So I don't know. I also didn't know that Mary Shelley had written things aside from Frankenstein. Yeah. But I found out recently that she also wrote, she wrote this one story called The Last Man, which is about the last man on earth after everyone else is dead, which I'd be that interested in. That makes a lot of sense as well, but that's the one actually. that helped me. Yeah, it does. Because everyone else is Poor dead. Thing. Everyone else is dead. I had a lot of fun researching it I, I, and telling it. I hope you had fun hearing about it, even though you knew about most of it. To be honest, a lot of my favourite parts are the bits well, that aren't specifically uh, her, like uh, Claire Claremont just following them around, and specifically John Polidori just um, yeah, that's like, writing so funny. his gossip mag about Lord Byron while supplying yeah. him with laudanum. Sometimes, yeah, no, you know, it's absolutely. fun to chat about stuff that we know together because yeah. then we know. Do you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean yes no no, no, no I know I mean, it's fun to come at it from two perspectives and I like... mean it's good sometimes for everyone to be on the same page yeah absolutely thank you for listening to the other Martha's podcast the show where a drama student and a film graduate talk about things we have no business knowing about if you enjoyed today's episode please do like the video and subscribe to our channel for more goodbye